Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? This morning, we are going to read Chapter 3 of Part 2 of 1984 by George Orwell. This will not be just a typical straight straight reading <coughs> of the of the material we will uh, stop and talk about interesting words and vocabulary or interesting phrases if you want me to read something again i will be happy to go back and look at it and uh, we can talk about the meanings of different phrases and different words so this is uh, great if you uh, are learning English and you want to expand your vocabulary, you want some more advanced vocabulary, or you want to understand expressions, this is a wonderful way to do it. But if you already speak English, this is great if you're a George Orwell fan and you want to uh, follow the, the writing very closely. Now, in the last chapter, Winston had uh, made contact with this girl from work, and they, they had a, an affair. They met in a secret place in the forest, and they had an affair. And that's where we stopped last time. So let's see what happens. This is chapter three. We can come here once again, said Julia. It's generally safe to use any hideout twice but not for another month or two, of course. And as she woke up, her demeanor had changed. She had, she became alert and businesslike. Demeanor, that's kind of an interesting word. Demeanor is maybe how uh, people see you, your, your, the way you physically show yourself to other people. So if you have a, a sad demeanor, you look sad. And if you have an angry demeanor, you appear to be angry. Let's just check the official definition of demeanor. Your outward behavior. So how we, how people look, how people see you when you're when you're acting physically. Uh, the way you stand, the way you talk, your facial expressions, and more. Well, you know, demeanor. That's actually a good word. I'm going to put that on my list of words to make videos about later. Demeanor. So the way you talk, the way you move around physically, you can do it in an angry way, in a, in a depressed way, all kinds of ways. The way you carry yourself, maybe, would be another way of saying that. Okay, let's get rid of that demeanor. Okay, as soon as she woke up, her demeanor had changed. So they they had this love affair, and then she fell asleep in the forest. But when she woke up, her body language, demeanor, body language maybe is another way of thinking of demeanor. She became alert and businesslike. So before she was very romantic, but now she she uh, took a nap, she woke up, and now she was behaving uh, very businesslike. Put her clothes on, knotted the scarlet sash about her waist. So remember, she has a sash that's like a... You know, we've never looked up the word sash to, to see what it means. Let's see. But probably if I just put sash... And, oh yeah, they have it here. Okay. So a sash, because I don't know if I've ever really explained it in a very good way. So let's take a look. This is a sash. So so she wears a sash because she's a member of the anti-sex league. <laughs> so she's part of a group that is always against having sex. And that sash says something like that, anti-sex league or something. So uh, before before they had the affair, she she threw the sash off, and then they had their affair. But now she's very businesslike. She put the sash back on. She tied it on. Okay. Let's see. As soon as she woke up, her demeanor had changed. 
She became alert and businesslike, put her clothes on, knotted the scarlet sash about her waist, and began arranging the details of the journey home. It seemed natural to leave this to her. That's actually another good phrase. We're starting off with a lot of interesting phrases. Okay, leave it to her. To leave something to someone means to uh, to let them be in charge, to let them manage things. If you leave something to someone, it could mean several different things, but in this context it means um, giving, the, giving the person all the power, letting them make the decisions. How do they use it here? It seemed natural to leave this to her. So she was explaining, all right, this is how you get home. Because remember, they met in secret in the forest outside of the city. And now she's giving him details about this is the way to go home. And he thought it's best to leave it to her. Let her decide. Let her manage how to do this. Because she knows what she's doing, obviously. <laughs> She obviously had a practical cunning. A cunning is a type of intelligence. So she was obviously very smart in a practical way. Which Winston lacked. And she seemed also to have an exhaustive knowledge of the countryside round London, stored away from innumerable community hikes. The route she gave him was quite different from the one by which he had come, and brought him out at a different railway station. Never go home the same way as you went out, she said, as though enunciating an important general principle. She would leave first, and Winston was to wait half an hour before following her. She had named a place where they could meet. After work. Four evenings hence. Uh, hence means like from here. So four, four evenings from here. It's not a very common word now, but hence would mean like from here. So four, four days from here. So four days from now. It was a street in one of the poorer quarters where there was an open market, which was generally crowded and noisy. She would be hanging about among the stalls, pretending to be in search of shoelaces or sewing thread. If she judged that the coast was clear, uh, she would blow her nose. <laughs> it's blowing your nose. <laughs> Sorry for the disgusting noises. Blowing, your no blowing her nose when he approached. Otherwise, he was to walk past her without recognition, but with luck, in the middle of the crowd, it would be safe to talk for a quarter of an hour and arrange another meeting. And now I must go, she said, as soon as, as soon as he had mastered his instructions. I'm due back at 1930. I've got to put in two hours for the Junior Anti-Sex League. That's her sash. It says the Junior Anti-Sex League. Handing out leaflets. Leaflets are little pieces of paper with information. So you know, maybe in the city where you live, sometimes people will stand on the corner and give give uh, little pieces of paper with information. Did you know how to lose weight? You know, something like that. But this is about anti-sex. <laughs> so they stand on the street corner giving people pieces of information saying, don't have sex. This is why. Handing out leaflets or something. Isn't it bloody? Give me a brush down. Would you wait? Am I missing something here? Let me reread that. Give me a brush down. Would you? I don't really understand that, to be honest with you. Have I got any twigs in my hair? Oh, give me a brush down. OK, so brushing uh, what that means. I didn't really understand it until the next 
line. But in case you don't know what a brush is, a brush is something like this. It's a pretty common word. So it could be anything in this form. These are all types of brushes. So she's saying, give me a, a brush down because they were they were on the ground outside in the country. So she's saying, here, do this, do this to me. Give me a brush down. Make sure there's nothing, doesn't look like I've been rolling around in the grass. Give me a brush down, would you? Have I got any twigs in my hair? Twigs are little, like, uh, the gr you know, you have a leaf, and you have, like, the green part of a leaf, and then you have the little brown part, which is like a stem. That's also kind of a twig. That's what a twig is. It's a small, little small piece of a tree. Like a baby branch. Have I got any twigs in my hair? Are you sure? Then goodbye, my love. Goodbye. She flung herself into his arms, kissed him almost violently, and a moment later pushed her way through the saplings. Remember, the saplings are like little baby trees. And disappeared into the wood with very little noise. Even now, he had not found out her surname or her address. However, it made no difference, for it was inconceivable that they could have ever met, uh, they could ever meet indoors or exchange any kind of written communication. As it happened, they never walked back to the clearing in the wood during the month of May. There were only one uh, there was there was only one further occasion on which they actually succeeded in making love. That was in another hiding place known to Julia the belfry of a ruinous church in an almost deserted stretch of country where an atomic bomb had fallen 30 years earlier. It was a good, it was a good hiding place when once you got there, but getting there was very dangerous. For the rest, they could meet only in the streets in a different place every evening, and never for more than half an hour at a time in the street it was usually possible to talk after a fashion. That, that phrase, after a fashion, means like in a particular way, in a particular manner. So obviously this means like uh, not looking at each other, talking very lowly, pretending they don't know each other. As they drifted down the crowded pavements, not quite abreast and never looking at one another, they carried on a curious intermittent conversation, which flicked on and off like the beams of a lighthouse. You know, if you... Let's... I want to find a picture to show you. Uh... I'm forgetting my English. Couldn't think what to call this thing. Okay. What do you call this? What do you see this picture here? What is this? What is this person doing? And, and what do you call that? Uh, well, he's turning on the lights and that thing is called a light switch. So uh, I, I guess these are pretty old. I don't know if they, they make them like this anymore. But that, that motion with your finger is flicking. That's flicking. So that's flicking the lights on or flicking the lights off. So it's like a quick, short movement to, to flick something. And uh, here they're talking about they were meeting in an old church and well let's go back and read that from the beginning they carried on a curious intermittent conversation which flicked on and off so flicking think about flicking the lights on and off flicking on and off which flicked on and off it was very short 
and quick each each phrase uh, maybe she would say a phrase very shortly and quickly and then he would and then it would stop for some period and then it would start again flicked on and off like the beams of a lighthouse so the beams are like the the rays of light the lines of light that you see coming Suddenly nipped into silence by the approach of a party uniform or the proximity of a telescreen and then taken up again minutes later in the middle of a sentence, then abruptly cut short as they parted at the agreed spot, then continue almost without introduction on the following day. Julia appeared to be quite used to this kind of conversation, which she called talking by installments. If you pay something by credit card and then every month you have to make a little payment, right? Maybe it's $30, $40. You don't pay 100% of the item at one time. So you, you pay every month for a year, whatever. That's called paying by installments. So you, you have the, the entire thing you have to pay, but you pay it very in very small amounts. That's called paying by installments. So what do you think that she means by talking by installments? It's the same idea. <laughs> so they, they say a few words, and then they stop, and they wait a long time, and they say a few more words. Eventually, after a long period of time, maybe they've had a conversation but they can only talk little by little, talking in installments. She was also surprisingly adept, that means like an expert, at speaking without moving her lips. Just once in almost a month of nightly meetings, they managed to exchange a kiss. They were passing in silence down a street. Julia would never speak when they were away from the main streets. When there was a deafening roar. <clears throat> deafening. To be deaf means you can't hear. If something is deafening, it means it's so loud that uh, it causes damage to your ears. Very, very loud. A deafening roar. The earth heaved. That means the earth moved. And the air darkened, and Winston found himself lying on his side, bruised and terrified. A rocket bomb must have dropped quite near at hand. Suddenly, he became aware of Julia's face, a few centimeters from his own, deathly white, as white as chalk. Even her lips were white. She was dead. He clasped, remember clasp is like this, he clasped, clasped, that's hard to say, clasped her against him and found that he was kissing a live, Formed face. <clears throat> but there was some powdery stuff that got in the way of his lips. Both of their faces were thickly coated with plaster. There were evenings when they reached their rendezvous and then had to walk past one another without a sign. Because the patrol had just come round. Because a patrol had just come round the corner, or a helicopter was hovering overhead. We, I think in the first chapter of this book, we had the word hover, which means like flying but not moving. So if you ever see some kind of, some insects, they can hover. They fly, they're, they're in the air, but they're not moving. You know, birds, I don't think, most birds can't hover. A hummingbird could hover. That means like the, the bird is flying, but it's not moving back and forth. It's just in one place. Helicopters also hover. Helicopters. Airplanes cannot hover, but helicopters can hover. 
And uh, that's also used with the internet when you hover your mouse over something. A little arrow, hover the cursor over something. Because the cursor is above it, but it's not moving. It's staying in one place. Like a helicopter. Even if it had been less dangerous, it would still have been difficult to find time to meet. Winston's working week was 60 hours. Julia's was even longer, and their free time and their free days varied according to the pressure of work and did not often coincide. Julia, in any case, seldom had any evening completely free. She spent an astonishing amount of time in attending lectures and demonstrations, distributing literature for the Junior Anti-Sex League, preparing banners for Hate Week, making collections for the Savings Campaign, and such like activities. It paid, she said. It was camouflage. Camouflage, in case you don't know that word, let's, let's take a look at what camouflage is. This is camouflage. So why, why does this soldier dress in this way? And why does he paint his face? It's so that people, in theory, people cannot see him, right? That's what camouflage means. It's like a disguise. And here, uh, they're talking about Julia doing all of these activities. She's part of the anti-sex league. She's preparing for hate week. She makes collections for savings campaigns. And Julia says, I do it because it's camouflage. Actually, I hate all of these things, but I participate because then no one thinks that I hate them. <laughs> Something like that. She even in a oh, wait, let's see. Uh, if you kept the small rules, you could break the big ones. So that's the idea that if she does all of these little things, then nobody will suspect her, and she can break big rules. It's camouflage. She even induced Winston to mortgage yet another of his evenings by enrolling himself for the part-time munition work, which was done voluntarily by zealous party members. Uh, so somebody who is zealot is a very strong believer in... It's usually used for religion, so... Somebody who has a very strong belief in their religion is uh, considered a zealot. But also, I guess the, the idea of a zealot is they insist because, you know, there's nothing wrong with believing very strongly in your religion. But uh, the thing about a zealot is kind of a, a negative word. And I think that negativity comes from a zealot insists that everybody else follows the same rules. Well, let's just take a look at the official definition of zealot. See how close I was. <laughs> a person who is fanatical and uncompromising in the pursuit of their religious, political, or other ideals. Yeah, but I think there's this idea that a zealot will try to make you also follow these rules because they believe in them so strongly they can't understand why anyone would not follow the rules. So zealous party members, those are party members who uh, are very, believe in the party very strongly. So one evening every week, Winston spent four hours of paralyzing boredom, screwing together small bits of metal, which were probably parts of bomb fuses in a, in a drafty, ill-lit workshop where the knocking of hammers mingled drearily with the music of the telescreens. When they met in the church tower, the gaps in their fragmentary conversation were filled up. It was a blazing afternoon. That means it was uh, the sun was very bright and hot. It was a blazing afternoon. The air in the little square chamber above the bells was hot and stagnant. Stagnant means doesn't move. So if something is stagnant, it's not moving or changing. 
And so if you talk about stagnant water, that would be usually water that could make you sick because it's water that never moves. So things stay in there and become uh, thing, things live in there that normally can't live in moving water. And if you drink it, you probably wouldn't drink stagnant water. It probably smells bad and tastes bad. Stagnant air, that would be like being in a room where the air never changes, it never moves. So that's not a pleasant feeling. Uh, that room probably smells bad. Uh, it's not very comfortable. And we're just talking about the air quality. So, uh, so they were in this little room, in this hot little room, and it, it was hot and stagnant. So you could smell old things in there because nothing ever changes or moves in there, in the air. And smelt overpoweringly of pigeon dung. So you see, that's the thing. There were pigeons going to the bathroom in this room. And because there's no wind, there's nothing to make the air move. The air is stagnant in that room. Uh, it smells extra bad. I didn't even know that you could smell pigeon poo. <laughs> but if you're in a stag hot, stagnant room, maybe you can. Okay, let's see. Dung is poop. They sat talking for hours on the dusty, twig-littered floor. Now, I, I said that twigs... Well, let's just take a, a little picture, a little look at a picture of twigs. Uh, they're just like small branches. So these are twigs. See, twigs. Little pieces from a tree. Good for starting fires. So, and littering, you maybe you've seen that word like a sign. No littering. Littering means like throwing things on the floor. So if you're walking through the city, you'll see signs. Littering, $500 fine. That means if you throw something in the street, if you throw garbage in the street and the police see you, then you'll have to pay $500. Littering means putting things garbage in the street. So the twigs littering the floor means that they were all over the floor. It didn't look nice. It looked like garbage. They shouldn't be there. Littering is a negative word. They sat talking for hours on the dusty, twig-littered floor, one or other of them getting up from time to time to cast a glance through the arrow slits and make sure there was no one coming. So from time to time, they would look out the window to make sure that there were no people coming to see them there. They didn't want to get caught. Julia was 26 years old. She lived in a hostel with 30 other girls, always in the stink of women. How I hate women, she said uh, parenthetically. She worked, as he had guessed, on the novel writing machines in the fiction department. She enjoyed her work, which consisted chiefly in running and serv servicing a, power, a powerful but tricky electric motor. She was not clever. Clever is another word for smart. But was fond of using her hands and felt at home with the machinery. She could describe the whole process of composing a novel from the general directive issued by the planning committee down to the final touching up by the rewrite squad. A squad is like a group of people. It's usually used when talking about uh, military or attacking. A squad is like a group of people ready to defend or attack. So the rewrite squad, that's like, uh, you know, imagine they write a book and then they say, oh no, we have to change the information in the book. There's a team ready for this emergency that can take the book and rewrite the story to fit the latest narrative. But she was not interested in the finished product, or project, product. 
She didn't much care for reading, she said. Books were just a commodity that had to be produced, like jam or boot laces. A commodity is just something that you can buy and sell. She had no memories of anything before the early 60s, and the only person she had ever known who talked frequently of the days before the revolution was a grandfather who had disappeared when she was eight. Oh, Fabian Perez. Hey, Fabian. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in quite a while. Hope you're doing well. At school, she had been captain of the hockey team and had won the gymnastics trophy two years running. She had been a troop leader in the spies and a branch secretary in the youth league before joining the junior anti-sex league. She had always borne an excellent character. This word born means like carry. She always had or she always carried or she always showed an excellent character. She had even an infallible mark of good reputation, been picked out, been picked out to work in the porno sec, the subsection of the fiction department, which turned out cheap pornography for distribution among the proles. Gosh, this sounds like the modern day internet. And we have Nam Gyan is saying hello. Hi, Nam Gyan. And we have Antonio Montana. Greetings from Turkey. Oh, so you're in Turkey. And Antonio Montana, that doesn't sound very Turkish. <laughs> I thought maybe you were from Latin America or from Spain. Let's see. Uh, okay, so so let's, it was nicknamed Muck House by the people who worked in it, she remarked. There she had remained for a year, helping to produce booklets and sealed packets with titles like Spanking Stories or one night in a girl's school to be bought furtively. Furtively means like secretly, like hiding it uh, by proletarian youths who were under the impression that they were buying something illegal. What are these books like? Said Winston curiously. Oh, ghastly rubbish. Ghastly means like horrible. Ghastly rubbish. They're boring, and rubbish is garbage. So, oh, they're horrible garbage. Ghastly rubbish. Ghastly, it's a very British word. I don't think you, you really hear that outside of the UK. Maybe some people will use it. That whole phrase, ghastly rubbish, that's very kind of UK sounding. They're boring, really. They only have six plots, but they swap them round a bit. Swapping means like moving around, changing. Actually, swap, that might be a good word to practice later. Let's put that up here. Swap. Whoops. Swap kind of means like exchange or moving around. Ghastly rubbish. They're boring, really. They only have six plots, but they, they swap them around a bit. Of course, I was only on the kaleidoscopes. I was never in the rewrite squad. I'm not literary, dear. Not even enough for that. He learned with astonishment that all the workers in the porno, the porno sec, except the heads of the departments, were girls. The theory was that men whose sex instincts were less controllable than those of women were in greater danger of being corrupted by the filth they handled. Filth means dirt, dirty. So, uh, let, wait, let me read that again. The heads of the depart everyone except for the heads of the department were girls. The theory was that men whose sex instincts were less controllable than those of women were in greater danger of being corrupted by the filth they handled. So they were afraid that if they let men write these stories, it would corrupt them, but for some reason, it wouldn't corrupt women. She had had her first love affair when she was 16 with a party member 
of 60 who later committed suicide to avoid arrest. And a good job, too, said Julia. Otherwise, they'd have my name out of him when he confessed. Since then, there had been various others. Life, as he saw it, was quite simple. You wanted a good time. They, meaning the party, wanted to stop you having it. You broke the rules as best you could. You seemed to think it just as natural that they should want to rob you of your pleasures as that you should want to avoid being caught. She hated the party and said so in the crudest words. Crude means like raw. And here what crude means is she used very, very hard language talking about them. She was not polite when she criticized the party. She used maybe swear words or uh, very ugly words to describe them. She wasn't afraid. She used very strong language to talk about them. Uh, Antonio Montana says, by the way, we are living in 1984. We can feel every line of this book right now. Yes, I think you're right. I think that's very true. Extremely true. After this, when we finish this book, uh, there's another book called A Brave New World, which was written in the 1920s or 1930s. And that also is supposed to describe, seems to describe what, what's happening in this world. So that I'm looking forward to reading that book when I finish this book. Except where it touched upon her own life, she had no interest in party doctrine. He noticed that she never used newspeak words except when uh, ones that had passed into everyday use. She had never heard of the Brotherhood and refused to believe in its existence. Any kind of organized revolt against the party was bound to be a failure struck her as stupid. The clever thing was to break the rules and stay alive at the same time. So she didn't believe in all of these conspiracies about a secret group fighting the government, and she didn't, she didn't believe that it was even possible to fight and win against the government. Uh, her, the, her mentality was just try to look like you're following the rules, and when nobody's looking, you can break them, and that's the best way to survive. The clever thing was to break the rules and stay alive at the same time. He wondered vaguely how many others like her there might be in the younger generation, people who had grown up in the world of the revolution, knowing nothing else, accepting the party as something unalterable. Alter means change, so unalterable means you can't change it. Like the sky, not rebelling against its authority, but simply evading it, as a rabbit dodges a dog. They did not discuss the possibility of getting married. It was too remote to be worth thinking about. No imaginable committee would ever sanction such a marriage even if Catherine, Winston's wife, could somehow have gotten, be got rid of. It was hopeless, even as a daydream. She was, do you know, the new speak word, uh, good thinkful, meaning naturally orthodox, incapable of thinking a bad thought. No, I don't know the word, but I know the kind of person right enough. He began telling her the story of his married life, but curiously enough, she appeared to know the essential parts of it already. She described to him, almost as though she had seen or felt it, the stiffening of Catherine's body as soon as he touched her. Stiff means like don't move, very hard, can't, can't really move. So the stiffening of her body means that when he touched her, he could feel her body be like a statue and not move. The stiffening of Catherine's body as soon as he touched her. The way in which she still seemed to be pushing him from her with all her strength, even when her arms were clasped tightly round him. 
With Julia, he felt no difficulty in talking about such things. Catherine, in any case, had long ceased to be a painful memory and became merely a, dis a distasteful one. Distasteful means, uh, I don't like it. People don't like it. So uh, distasteful, not, not a very good taste. So if you, if you make like a distasteful remark, actually, that's a good word. Let's put the word distasteful up here. I need some more words on my list. So distasteful, that means tastes bad. It doesn't taste good. So if you make a distasteful remark, that's a remark. That's something you say and people say, oh, I don't like that. A distasteful memory would be a memory like you have the memory and it gives you a bad taste. Like, oh, I remember that. That's horrible. Distasteful, bad taste. I could have stood it if it had been uh, for, uh, wait, let me, let me try that again. I could have stood it if it hadn't been for one thing. To, you, if you think about that phrase, I can't stand it, it means I can't tolerate it. Oh, I can't stand loud music. So this is the past. This is the past using could have stood which means I could have tolerated it. It would have been okay. It would have been okay, but for one thing. So it, it was possible to, to live this way, but there was one problem. That's what he's saying. He told her about the frigid little ceremony that Catherine had forced him to go through on the same night every week. She hated it, but nothing would make her stop doing it. She used to call it but you'll never guess. Our duty to the party, said Julia promptly. How did you know that? I've been, I've been at school too, dear. Sex talks once a month for over 16, for over 16s. And in the youth movement, they rub it into your, into you for years. I dare say it works in a lot of cases, but of course you can never tell. People are such hypocrites. And I think we had that word hypocrite in uh, an earlier chapter, maybe the last chapter. Remember, a hypocrite is someone who says one thing, but then they do the opposite thing. So, oh yeah, that was actually not part of a book. That was part of a class video that I did. So a hypocrite says one thing, don't smoke, as they smoke. So that's the difference. Uh, let's see. So she began to enlarge upon the subject. With Julia, everything came back to her own sexuality. As soon as this was touched upon in any way, she was capable of great acuteness. Unlike Winston, she had grasped the inner meaning of the party's sexual puritanism. It was not merely that sex instinct created a world of its own which was outside the party's control and which therefore had to be destroyed, if possible, what was more important was that sexual privation induced hysteria, which was desirable because it could be transformed into war fever and leader worship, uh, leader worship. The way she put it was, when you make love, you're using up energy and, after towards, and afterwards you feel happy and don't give a damn about anything else. They can't bear that you feel like that. So they didn't want you to have sex because they wanted you to have that energy inside of you so they could use it for other things, to make you angry, to make you uh, zealots of the party. They want you to be bursting with energy all the time. All this marching up and down and cheering and waving flags is, sim is simply sex gone sour. If you're happy inside yourself, you should get excited about Big Brother and the three-year plans and the two minutes hate and the rest of their bloody rot. This was very true. There was a direct, intimate connection between chastity. Chastity means not having sex and political orthodoxy. 
For how could the fear, the hatred, and the, the lunatic credulity which the party needed in its members be kept at the right pitch? That, uh, except by bottling down some powerful instinct and using it as a driving force. So the, he's thinking, oh, that explains, that really explains why people are so crazy. Because the party doesn't let them have sex. They have all this energy. And that's why uh, they, they have to do something with that energy. So they act crazy about uh, whatever, the, the wars, the parties, the politics. The sex impulse was dangerous to the party, and the party had turned it to account. They had played a similar trick with the instinct of parenthood. The family could not actually be abolished, and indeed, people were encouraged to be fond of their children, in almost the old-fashioned way. The children, on the other hand, were, syst were st systematically turned against their parents. To turn someone against another person means to make them your enemy. So the government couldn't destroy families, so they encouraged the parents to, to be very good to their children. But then when the children would go to school, the system would turn the children against the parents. The system would make the children the enemy of the parents. Oh, Antonio Montana is asking me, what's one of my favorite songs? Gosh, I don't know. I've never thought about that, like having a favorite song. <laughs> Why are you asking that question? Let's see. The children, on the other hand, were systematically turned against their parents and taught to spy on them and report their deviations. The family had become, in effect, an extension of the thought police. It was a device by means of which... Everyone could be surrounded night and day by informers who knew him intimately. Abruptly, that means very quickly, very unexpectedly, his mind went back to Catherine. Catherine would un unquestionably have denounced him to the thought police if she had not happened to be too stupid to detect the unorthodoxy of his opinions. But what they really recalled her, uh, recalled her to him, but what really recalled her to him at this moment was the stifling heat. Stifling means like you can't breathe. <laughs> I, I said to Antonio, why are you asking me what's my favorite song? <laughs> Where did that come from? And he says, I want to understand your subconscious or the inner world of you. Well, good luck with that, because I can't even understand that. <laughs> okay, let's see. Thought police, if she had not happened to be too stupid to detect the unorthodoxy of his opinions. But what really recalled her to him at this moment was the stifling heat. Uh, so stifling means like can't breathe. So, have you ever been in a situation where it's so hot you feel like you can't breathe? That's like stifling heat. That's what stifling heat is. Which had brought the sweat out onto his forehead. He began telling Julia of something that had happened, or rather had failed to happen, on another sweltering summer afternoon 11 years ago. It was three or four months after they were married. They had lost their way on a community hike somewhere in Kent. They had only lagged behind uh, the others for a couple of minutes. That word lag means to be slower or to, uh, well, let's see. I just want to see how they define that word. Maybe you've heard of jet lag. That's when you, if you fly to the other side of the world for a few days, you'll be uncomfortable because you're your body is in a different time zone. Your body is slower. Like a delayed effect, a delay being slow. Yeah, that's, that's what it means. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Fabian Perez says, what, what does sweltering mean? That's a word that's always used with heat. So, 
Uh, I've never really thought about what that word sweltering means, but it's always used with heat and it means like a very uncomfortable hot heat. But let's let's take a look and see what the definition is. The, the only time you'll hear sweltering is when people are talking about heat. Uh, uncomfortably hot. So uh, this is a way of saying that something is an uncomfortable hot. So a sweltering day is a day that's extremely hot. So, so hot that it's uncomfortable. But they took a wrong turning and presently found themselves pulled up short by the edge of an old chalk quarry. It was a sheer drop of 10 or 20 meters with boulders at the bottom. There was nobody of whom they could ask the way. So, the, so they, they're becoming lost, and it's not possible to ask for directions. As soon as she realized that they were lost, Catherine became very uneasy. To be away from the noisy mob. Mob means like group of people, but it's a negative word. So when you talk about a mob, this is a group of people maybe doing bad things, or everything negative about a crowd of people, maybe you could say. So a noisy mob. Uh, if you said noisy crowd, you could say noisy crowd, if you know the word crowd, the noisy crowd. But the difference is when you say noisy mob, it sounds so much worse because being in a mob, a big group of bad people, people you hate, <laughs> sounds so much worse than being in a noisy crowd. A noisy mob of hikers, even for a moment, gave her a feeling of wrongdoing. She wanted to hurry back by the way they had come and start searching in the other direction. But at this moment, Winston noticed some tufts of lucis strife growing around the cracks of the cliff. I don't know what lucis strife is. Tuft is like a kind of like a bush. We'll look at a we'll look at tuft in a minute. But I guess Lucis Strife must be some kind of plant. Uh, let's see if we can find some pictures. Well, it's funny because when I look for pictures of Lucis Strife, it looks like lavender. And these are the pictures of Lucis Strife. Let's see. Now, if I say tuft. Tuft is like a, a a group of something, kind of like a bush almost. Wait, let's if I look for tuft. So it's like a group of, in this case, it's grass. Tuft. This is like a tuft of grass. You could have a tuft of hair, a tuft of grass. It's just like a big group of long, stringy things, I guess. All right, let's go back. How do they? Now that we know those words, let's read that again. Winston noticed some tufts of lucis stripes. So now you can picture groups of these, these lavender-like flowers growing in the cracks of the cliff between them. One tuft was of two colors, magenta and brick red, apparently growing on the same root. He had never seen anything of the kind before, and he called to Catherine to come and look at it. Uh, he Suk Joan says, so, so pleased to see this live. Well, I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy that you're watching. I'm pleased that you're here. Look, Catherine, look at those flowers that clump down there near the bottom. Do you see their two different colors? She had already turned to go, but she did rather fretfully come back uh, for a moment. To fret, to fret is like to worry. So remember, Catherine is very worried because they, they got lost and separated from the group. And all she wants to do is return to the group. But Winston says, hey, wait, come over here. Look at these flowers. And so she, she comes back, but she's doing it like this, like she's very worried. That's what fretfully means. She even leaned over the cliff face to see where he was pointing. He was standing a little behind her, and he put his hand on her waist to steady her. 
At this moment, it suddenly occurred to him how completely alone they were. There was not a human creature anywhere, not a leaf stirring. That word stirring means moving. So, so everything was very still, nothing was moving. Not even a leaf, not even a leaf from a tree was stirring, was moving. Everything was still, nothing was moving. Not a leaf stirring. Not even a leaf was moving. Not even a bird awake. In a place like this, the danger that there would be a hidden microphone was very small. And if there was a microphone, it would only pick up sounds. It was the hottest, sleepiest hour of the afternoon. The sun blazed. Uh, blaze means like very strong light and heat. So uh, if, you, if you have a blazing fire, that's a fire with a lot of light and heat. And in the afternoon, in the summer, and there are no clouds in the sky, and you just see that big ball of fire in the, in the sky, that is a blazing sun. The sweat tickled his face, and the thought struck him. Strike is like hit. The, the thought hit him. Why didn't you give her a good shove? Said Julia. I would have. <laughs> so he's, he's telling this story to his girlfriend, Julia, his lover. And she's looking over the cliff. Oh, in case you don't know what a cliff is. I think I better, better show you a picture of that. So uh, they're, they're out in nature walking around and there's, they're at a cliff. This is a cliff, not the water part, just the... A cliff is like a mountain, only a mountain goes like this. A cliff goes like this, that's what it is. And Winston says, hey, look at those flowers. And, and his wife is, is looking over the cliff, trying to see the flowers. And Julia says, why didn't you push her? <laughs> I would have pushed her. Why didn't you give her a good shove? Shove is like push. I would have. Oh, yes, dear, you would have. I would if I'd been the same person then as I am now. Or perhaps I would. Uh, I'm not certain. Are you sorry you didn't? Yes, on the whole, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't. They were sitting side by side on the dusty floor. He pulled her closer against him. Her head rested on his shoulder the pleasant smell of her hair conquering the pigeon dung. So remember the that room where they are <clears throat> has stagnant air. That means the air never moves. And there's pigeon dung in the room. That's pigeon poop. And so because the air doesn't circulate, it doesn't move, it's stagnant. There's a very bad smell in the room. But now he's saying, now that she's very close to him, he can smell her hair, and uh, now he doesn't smell the pigeon dung, the pigeon poop, anymore. The pleasant smell of her hair conquering the pigeon dung. She was very young, he thought. She still expected something from life. She did not understand that to push an incon inconvenient person over a cliff solves nothing. Actually, it would have made no difference, he said. Then why are you sorry you didn't do it? Only because I prefer a positive to a negative. In this game that we're playing, we can't win. Some kinds of failure are better than other kinds, that's all. He felt her shoulders wriggle of descent. So wriggling is a movement kind of like this. And so he felt her shoulders wriggle in descent. Descent means disagreement. So Winston is trying to explain to her uh, if, if I killed her that day, that wouldn't have fixed any problems. That wouldn't have solved any problems. But uh, she doesn't understand that. She disagrees. She thinks it would have helped to fix the problem, I guess. She always contradicted him when he said anything of this kind. She would not accept it as a law of nature that the individual 
is always defeated. In a way, she realized that she herself was doomed. To be doomed means to that something horrible is going to happen. Doom means something horrible is going to happen. And so if you're doomed, that means uh, something horrible is going to happen to you in the future, in your life. In a way, she realized that she herself was doomed. In a, in a way, she realized that she had a horrible future. That sooner or later, the thought police would catch her and kill her. But with another part of her mind, she believed that it was somehow possible to construct a secret world in which you could live as you, cho as you chose. All you needed was luck and cunning and boldness. Cunning means being very smart. So all you needed to do was be lucky, to be cunning, to be very smart, and boldness. Boldness means being very brave. So the way to survive was to be lucky, smart, and very brave. She did not understand that there was no such thing as happiness, that the only victory lay in the far future, long after you were dead. From that moment of declaring war on the party, it was better to think of yourself as a corpse. A corpse is a dead body. Well, let's reread that. So, uh, long after you were dead, that from the moment of declaring war on the party, so, so from the moment you decided, I hate the party, and you start to work against them, it was better to think of yourself as a dead body, as already dead. So once you, once you break the rules, you should understand you are already dead. Eventually they will kill you. We are the dead, he said. We are not dead yet, said Julia prosaically. Not physically. Six months, a year, five years, conceivably. I'm afraid of death. You're young, so presumably uh, you're more afraid of it than I am. Obviously, we shall put it off as long as possible. To put something off is... I'm going to put that. That's a useful phrasal verb. So we'll see. To put... Maybe I've done it before. It seems like I have. I don't know. We can do it again. doesn't matter. To put... Because it's very useful. Very common. Let me just type it. I can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> to put something off means to delay something. How do they use it here? Obviously, we shall put it off as long as we can. So the thing they were putting off is being killed by the party. Obviously, we can de delay this for a long time. Let's try to make this... Let's not make it tomorrow that they kill us. Let's try to survive one year, two years, three years. Let's delay it. Let's put it off. But it makes very little difference. So long as human beings stay human, death and life are the same thing. Oh, rubbish. Which would you sooner sleep with, me or a skeleton? Don't you enjoy being alive? Don't you like feeling? This is me. This is my hand. This is my leg. I'm real. I'm solid. I'm alive. Don't you like this? She twisted herself around and pressed her bosom against him. He could feel her breasts, ripe yet firm. Through her overalls, uh, her body seemed to be pouring some of its youth and vigor into this, into his. Yes, I like that, he said. Then stop talking about dying. And now listen, dear. We've got to fix up about the next time we meet. We may as well go back to the place in the wood. We've given it, we've given it a good long rest. But you must, go, you must get there by a different way this time. I've got it all planned out. You take the train, but look, I'll draw it for you. And in her practical way, she scraped together a small square of dust with a twig from the pigeon's nest and began drawing up a map on the floor. All right, well, that's it. That is the end of chapter three of part two of 1984. 
by George Orwell. So uh, next time we will be reading from chapter four of part two. Thank you everyone who stayed and watched this time. Thank you for your questions and comments. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.